Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Have you ever been asked the question, have you been baptized? Or have you ever entertained the concept of New Testament baptism in your mind? Well, stay tuned. That's the basis for our discussion this morning right here on Give Me the Bible. I'm Dan Manuel, and I'll be serving as your host today, and we'll be calling on various ministers to discuss various aspects of this subject, New Testament baptism. Why is it important for one to be baptized? And we're going to first of all go to Brother Kerry Clark right now from over in Athens, Texas to uh, uh, share with us just what the Bible says about that. Kerry? Well, thank you, Dan. And as we look at it, we need to be baptized just to put it as plainly as we can because Jesus commanded it. And if we didn't say anything else for the next 30 minutes, that's enough. And I want you to listen to what Jesus said in Mark 16. You remember in verse 15, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now listen carefully to verse 16. These are the words of Christ. This is not a church of Christ preacher putting something in there. Listen to what Jesus said. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, you remember being taught in school that that little word and is a conjunction. It joins two things together. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus did not say, he that believeth is saved and then later on is baptized. That's not what Jesus said. And I remember my Lord saying in Luke chapter 6 and verse number 46, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You see, Jesus commanded baptism. And as we talked about last week, Jesus commanded repentance. These are not suggestions. These are commands of God. And as you look at what Jesus said in Mark 16, and as it's recorded by Matthew in Matthew chapter 28, you remember in verse number 18 that Jesus said, All power, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. You cannot read what Jesus said and not understand that baptism is commanded by Jesus Christ himself. And then, of course, the apostles. Echoing those words, Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized. Now notice this, every one of you, friends, baptism is commanded by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, Carrie, you are uh, speaking the truth this morning when you say it is that commandment of God. But you know, when you think about New Testament baptism, we understand that it's the very thing that unites us to Christ. You know, we always talk about the fact that we want to be united with the Lord Jesus. Do you know that according to Holy Scripture, it is the only act by which we actually are united to Christ? And so we're going to call on Perry Cowan to explain that for us this morning. Perry? Good morning once again, folks. Thank you for tuning in to give me the Bible. We do need to be baptized in order to be united with Christ, united. That means to be joined together, to be made as one, to become a part of the body of Christ. And if we truly believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is our savior, that's something that we're gonna really want to do. We want to be united with him. But how do we do that? Well, listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter six. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into, notice that word, Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Henceforth we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the 
glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, through baptism, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Paul further said in Galatians chapter 3, he said, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You put him on, you're in him. You're united with him. There is no other action. In the, you can start at Genesis chapter 1, read all the way through the end of Revelation chapter 22, and you won't find another way to get into Christ except you be baptized into Christ. How important is that? Well, I'm going to suggest to you it's very important because John 14 records these words of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I've said this many times through the years, and I'll continue to preach it until someone can show me in the Scripture that it's wrong. You cannot go through what you are not in. And you cannot be in Christ until you are baptized into him according to the scripture. Dan? Well, Brother Perry, you speak well this morning. And we thank you so much for reminding us of what God has really commanded all of us to do in order to go to heaven. And uh, we certainly understand that uh, there are numerous things that we must do. But baptism is, is one of them. You know, we become the children of God by that one act. Uh, you can't believe enough to be a child of God or even confess enough to be a child of God or repent enough. But in order for us to be the child of God, don't we have to be baptized, Brother Stephen Gumpert? Absolutely. What a privilege it is to be a child of God. Because in Christ and only in Christ is found salvation, John 14 and verse 6. And in Christ is found hope, Romans 8, 24 through 25. And we're also told that in Christ are all other spiritual blessings, 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness. So when we look at being a child of God, truly it is a privilege. And there's a spot in the Bible, a passage that says and describes how precious it really is to be called a child of God. First John chapter three and verse one, it says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called sons of God. Therefore, understanding this, how is it that we become children of God? Well, what, what, what must we really do? A similar question was asked of Peter in Acts chapter two and verse 37. Men and brethren, what must we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we need to understand when we have this message that we are to repent, we should repent, in order to become children of God. We also see in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether we were Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free, we are all made to drink in that one spirit. We also understand from Galatians chapter 3, 26 through 27, that we are all called to be sons of God through faith. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How important is it for us to have faith? Well, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Don't you want to be pleasing to God? If so, you'll do what he says. And what he says is that we should repent so that we can enjoy the family of God. It is great, Stephen, to be a part of the great family of God. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3 and verse 15. And how thrilled we are this morning that God has removed all of our sin stains and that we live in the presence of a God who loves us and cares for us. So we are his children. But you know, when you read the Bible, you understand there are other dimensions also of this great walk with God because of baptism. I'm gonna uh, call on Barry Haynes right now. And Barry, share with us some other things that really serve as benefits to us from our baptism into Christ. We wanna be baptized because it allows us to be born again. 
You know, that phrase born again is one that Jesus coins in John chapter 3 when he's talking with Nicodemus. He tells Nicodemus flat out, he said, one cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless he is born again. Of course, Nicodemus is confused by this. He's thinking of the natural physical process of birth, how one is, is, becomes alive, right? You're, you're born, and he said you can't reverse that process. You can't go back into your mother's womb. But Jesus here says he's talking about something different, a spiritual birth, a new creation. And he says, truly, unless this one is born of water and of spirit. You know, some people look and say uh, that baptism is just a, a symbolic act. It, it, has, it doesn't have any meaning other than, than it's a symbol of, of faith. But Jesus here says you must have water and spirit to be born again, to have that new creation. It's not just a symbolic act, it's a physical act that has spiritual consequences. You see, that's what he talks about here. When someone is baptized and they, they come out of the water, they're not going to look different. They're not going to have a different physique. They're not going to become a new age, but they are going to be spiritually a different person, a new creation. The effect is not visual, it's spiritual. In essence, what they're doing there is they're reenacting the gospel as Jesus was was, was, was died and was buried and raised again, we go through the same process in baptism. We die to an old life. We're buried in baptism. We're raised to a new life. You see, to be born again means that you become something new. And that newness comes in a spiritual creation, that new creation that we see so often referenced in the New Testament, that we're a new creation. And that new creation can only start when one is baptized. Baptism is essential because it allows us, it is the process of which we are born again. And we must be born again if we want to see the kingdom of God. And how true those words are. And I hope that we're taking to heart this morning this concept of baptism and why it is so important that we do it and that we do it in the right way. Uh, you know, sometimes people believe they're saved before they're baptized, and yet the Holy Scripture teaches that we're not saved until we are baptized. And that's the pattern that I want to follow, and I'm sure it's the pattern that you want to follow as well. And as Brother Jerry Munhollen explains this morning, uh, I hope that we'll take to heart these words. Jerry. Thank you, Dan. You know, as we talk about the, the proper order it is, as there is a steps of salvation, and belief is absolutely essential. In fact, you cannot be saved without believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But that is not only the only step that we take. And it says, as Dan had mentioned, and, and as was mentioned earlier at Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And I want to pause right there because I want to ask the question, we're saved from what? The answer is saved from our sins. And I want to turn to Romans chapter 6 when, to delve into this a little bit more as Paul talks about baptism and relationship of saved with sin. First of all, Paul says that we're saved from the practice of sin. Listen, listen to what he said in verse 1, Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, not in any way. God forbid, he says. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, we're saved from the practice of sin. Well, what does baptism have to do with being saved from the practice of sin? Look at verse 3. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? You see, we die to the practice of sin. We no longer live in sin. That puts us behind. Not only did we die to the practice of sin or we're saved from the practice of sin, we're that we are saved from the power of sin. Look at verse 11. Likewise, you reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through the Jesus Christ our Lord. We are dead indeed to the power of sin. Someone once said that as sin takes us farther than we ever wanted to go, keep us longer than we ever wanted to stay, and cost us more than we ever wanted to, st to pay, and there's a power of sin that we are saved from, and then finally we're saved from the penalty of sin. Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We're saved from the 
practice of sin, from the power of sin, and saved from the penalty of sin when we are buried with Christ in baptism. Now back to you, Dan. Well, Jerry, thank you uh, so much for those timely truths. And uh, as we continue along this morning, uh, we're going to call him Brother Chris Grota. You know, uh, Chris, I know that, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing to be cleansed, isn't it? I know some people that take a bath on Saturday night, whether they need it or not. <laughs> you know, we all take a shower. We all take a bath. We like to be clean. There's just that feeling of being clean, but nothing impresses us more than the cleaning of our lives spiritually to know that our sins are forgiven, that we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So help us understand this morning how that cleansing takes place in the blood of Jesus our Lord. Well, thank you, Dan, and thank you all for watching this morning. What a wonderful question that is. You know, Peter said in 1 Peter 3.21 that baptism does also now save us. It's not a um, putting away of the filth of the flesh uh, that is a physical bath, but it's an answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that can only come, uh, that conscience can only be cleaned by the blood of Christ, and so it's a different kind of bath. And Jesus commanded in Mark 16, 15, and 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And Acts 2, 38, uh, you know, Peter responded to those at Pentecost by saying, um, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so we're looking at salvation, the remission of sins, the cleansing of sins, the washing of sins, Acts 22 and verse number 16. And uh, we understand from Hebrews 9, 22 that uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. That was true of the Old Testament. It's true also of the New. Ephesians 1 verse number 7 explains to us that we have redemption in Christ through His blood and uh, that results in the forgiveness of our sins. I think it's important for us to understand that not only we have redemption, but we are justified by His blood, Romans 5 and verse number 9. And, and some people say, well, is that powerful water? Is that water that does that? No, there's no power in the water. Power is in the blood. But just like Naaman in 2 Kings 5, who had to go and dip in the Jordan seven times to be cleansed of his leprosy, or like the blind man in John 9 and verse number 7, who Jesus told to go wash the mud off his eyes in the pool of Siloam, there was no power in those waters either, but there was power behind the commandment. There was the authority in the Lord that gave the command. And when their obedient faith did what God said to do, it produced the blessing that God intended them to receive. And that's the same thing with baptism for the remission of sins. It's not a work lest we should boast, my friend. It is God's working in us, and we glory in Him. Back to you, Brother Dan. Well, Chris, your words are taken very appropriately this morning, and we appreciate it so much. You know, when we uh, think about baptism, there may be some other things that we've never really considered. I believe, according to the Bible, that it really is impossible for us to really worship God acceptably. I hear people say, well, you know, people can worship God in their own way. It doesn't really matter. And, but in order to worship acceptably, don't we have to be God's children? Uh, don't we have to be baptized in order to come before the throne of God in order to worship Him? We're going to call him with the scout bets to answer that question this morning. Dan, I think you are correct in that uh, rendition of Scripture there because God is concerned with the details, isn't he? He's always been concerned with the details. We think about all the way back in the garden. You can eat of every tree except that one. We think about when he tells uh, Noah to build the ark. You need to build it this specific way with this certain wood, these measurements, and we know the rest that follows there. Uh, in the building of the temple, there are very specific needs, very specific measurements that are to be had. God is a God of details, and the church is no different in the way he designed it, and how to get into the church is detailed. And within those details, we find that baptism is necessary for us to enter in, to be added to the body of Christ. As we see in the book of Acts, the beginning of the church, we see in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38, they are to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. The context continues there to continue or to explain their efforts, their continuation of what has been taught to them, what they were doing, why they were baptized, what they're going to do after they are baptized, and continuing in the work of the church. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1 
If we are going to be those who present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, what we would have already had to have done, what was needed. We would have had to have already presented ourselves as those who understand that we are sinners and we are in need of the blood of Christ. Worship is so vital to the body of Christ. As Christians, we should be those who, who seek out what Scripture says. To be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, to work towards that goal of heaven together. And so if we are not baptized, and we have not even begun our walk as a Christian. When we are baptized, we are added to the church. We are, our sins are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It is necessary. He wants us to worship in spirit and in truth. And if we're not following the truth, then we need to be careful. Dan? Well, Scout, you, uh, you have said it well this morning, and it is so true, for in the book of John 4 and verse 24, didn't Jesus say that uh, uh, God's a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth? And then he goes on to say, for such doth the Father seek. So if he's seeking those who are children of God and those who are Christians, certainly we cannot worship God acceptably without being his child. Now, uh, I want to go back to you with a follow-up question here, Scout, and, and can you share some additional scriptures? We may have oh, you know, left out a few this morning that would really be important, and maybe just to make sure we've tried to cover all the bases on this subject, I want you to go back and, and share just a few more thoughts with us along that line. Dan, much of what is going to be mentioned here in just a moment has been uh, spoken on this morning, but... It's nothing bad to repeat what Scripture is telling us. There are some additional reasons that we would desire to be baptized. And one is we're obeying Christ. Uh, obedience is a command as we're following Christ. And we know that he's going to set that example, not that he needed his sins washed away, but we know in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to, through 17, he is there. And John is pushing back of, Christ, you need to be the one baptizing me. And Christ says, Let's do it now so as to fulfill all righteousness. He's going to set our example for us. It is obedience to Christ. We also are in Christ once we are baptized. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3, we have all spiritual blessings. Verse number 7 as well. What a wonderful thought. What a wonderful ability to say that we have all spiritual blessings. It's an all-encompassing, something that we will never fully grasp. We are also... As we are baptized, we become a child of God. We are adopted into the sonship of God. And that means we have a beautiful inheritance awaiting for us one day. That is eternal life with Him. As was mentioned previously, we are to be born again. We, we have been washed in the blood. And if we are washed in the blood, then we have done what is necessary for us to be a new creation in God. To be born again. To be saved is a great reason. It's one that uh, without obedience to the Lord, without the commands that we're following to God, we're not going to gain that eternal life. Baptism adds us to the church and, and allows our name to be written in the book of life. First Peter chapter 3, verse number 21, we, baptism now saves us. And back to the beginning of the question, or the, the uh, program here, to be worshipped and or to worship acceptably is what our goal is. John chapter 4, verse number 24, as Dan mentioned right before we went back to this, that our worship is going to be those who worship him in spirit and in truth. And the truth is, baptism is necessary for us in our salvation. Well, Scout, thank you. And there you have it, my friend. We've tried to share with you an exhaustive um, explanation here this morning of New Testament baptism. One is not saved and then baptized, but one is baptized in order to be saved. And if we haven't followed that process, then we've not fully obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let me appeal to you today that if you're not a Christian, you're not a child of God, you're a sinner, and you're lost, and you're separated from God, why not come to the Lord? Give us a call, allow us to help you fulfill that great commandment of God or visit the Church of Christ in your area. There you'll find a group of people that are endeavoring to do the will of Jehovah God. 
I thank you so much for being a part of our program today. We want to uh, encourage you once again to write for uh, the DVD entitled Searching for Truth. It will point you back to those scriptures and you can go back and wind it again, rewind and go back and look at it again and till you digest it and get it down. And we want you to know the truth. That's what we're all about here. It's not about money. It's not about prestige. It's simply about letting you know what God has asked you to do. And we hope that you'll continue to watch our telecast each Sunday morning right here on this same station and on this same affiliate and uh, invite a friend to do so as well. I'm Dan Manuel, thanking you for joining us today. And please join us next week at this same time for another presentation of Give Me the Bible. Sing the sweetest song of all.